Good afternoon, Lisa Holm here. Hope you're all having a great day. Today we're gonna to talk about the peripheral vascular assessment. This is actually a component of the cardiovascular assessment, but I broke it up to make it a little bit easier to digest. The objectives of this lecture are to assess the relevant anatomy and physiology, and then we're going to focus on inspection, percussion, palpation, and auscultation of this system. We're going to review structure and function, subjective and objective data, the health history, the physical exam itself, and abnormal findings. The arteries that we're going to assess, so the largest we see up at the top is the temporal artery, the carotids, and then we do want to palpate and assess each one of these arteries. So for the arm, it's the brachial ulnar and the radial, and for the leg, it's femoral, popliteal, dorsalis pedis, and posterior tibial. Let's review the purpose of a vein. So a vein carries blood back to the heart, and it's a low pressure system versus an artery takes blood away from the heart. It pumps blood out of the heart to the system, and it's a high pressure system. We have deep veins, superficial veins, and perforators. So since veins are a low pressure system, it's dependent on muscle movement to get that blood back up, back up to the heart, and it uses valves to keep the blood there. And a perforator, a little connection, just a connector from one vein to another. So the function of the jugular veins, the internal jugular, is to collect blood from the skull, brain, and the superficial parts of the face, and the majority of the neck. The tributaries of the internal jugular include the inferior petrosal sinus, the facial, linguinal, pharyngeal, superior, and middle thyroid, and occasionally the occipital vein. The purpose of the veins in the arms is to provide nutrients to the tissues throughout the rest of the body. A little recap of the veins of the legs. There are deep veins. Notable ones are the femoral and popliteal. Superficial veins, and we hear about these venous duplex reports when we think a patient has a blood clot. So the most prominent superficial veins of the legs are the great saphenous, the small saphenous, and then again the perforators are the connecting veins. We have them all over. One thing I'd like to mention, a lot of the arteries in the arms, we palpated these in nursing school, but the one thing I wanted to mention is a lot of interventional procedures now utilizing a radial artery approach. This is called the transradial approach. Approach. And I mentioned this because they're using it in cardiac cath. 90% of the cases when I left Penn were utilizing the transradial approach in interventional or, or what they call body interventional radiology. They were up to about 60%. And the reason I mention this is making sure that the radial artery does not have a clot in it post-procedure is going to be really important. So assessing pulse and color sensation below the level of the wrist down in the fingers is going to be more important than ever. They can also nick the nerve and there can be nerve of damage. So more than ever, assessing our arteries in our arms is going to be important. And these are the vessels in the legs. What I will say is that you should always start assessing whether it's the arms or the legs. You should always assess distally and then work your way up towards the trunk of the body. So let me give you an example. It was with students on the floor and the patient's right leg was pretty much cold. The patient had a ton of pain and of course it was ignored by everyone. It was like it didn't even happen. And of course me and my student came into the room to assess and then as my student, as I call it, running the leg to check pulses all the way up the leg, dorsalis pedis was gone. There was no dorsalis pedis, foot completely cold. Then asked them to check posterior tib, no posterior tib. We were able to get a little bit of a popliteal, but long story short, after getting into a fight with the PA who said I was an alarmist, which is even more comical, the attending came in an hour later and heard about everything and the patient went back to the OR and ended up with a below the knee amputation. Running the leg or running the arm and making sure your pulses are the way they are is important. Sometimes we come to work and we're just not on our game. So if I can't palpate something appropriately and somebody just access that vessel, I'll get another set of hands. What could it hurt to get another set of hands just to check the vessel to make sure you're not crazy. And if and if both of you are coming up with the same assessment, then Doppler it and keep going up the chain of the command until somebody listens to you. And then the lymphatic ducts and drainage patterns. So during your assessment, you wanna be able to palpate all of these nodes. And there's a video in the course that will show you instead of me trying to narrate my way through it, which I don't know if I would do very well. Subjective data for the health history questions. We wanna find out if the patient has any leg pain or cramps. Some patients also mistake cramping for claudication. And what claudication is, it is the first sign of, of the leg that is getting too little blood flow. So it's a supply and demand problem. A lot of times patients will notice that as they get up to walk around, they'll have pain when they walk around, but if they rest or they're able to get off of their legs, they feel better. In time, they decrease their 
overall activity because they just know if they try to walk that far, they're going to have pain. Document this as intermittent claudication. Other things we want to look for are skin changes on the arms or legs, but the skin will get shiny. So when blood flow starts to decrease, the first thing we notice is we'll lose the hair follicle. So if there's no hair in an area, you have to be concerned that there's no blood flow to that area. Once the hair follicles die, that area starts to become shiny. And then the swelling would be for a, a different reason, like a CHF or, or or lots of different conditions. It could be lymphedema, but you want to note swelling. And is it pitting or non-pitting edema? Lymph nodes are enlarged. That's also a cancer risk. It Documenting enlarged lymph nodes is really important. And then medications, especially some medications make patients more prone to clot. Collecting our objective data and the physical exam, you'll want the following equipment. So you want a paper tape measure that you could just throw out and it's helpful that you can mark it, a tourniquet or a blood pressure cuff, a stethoscope, a Doppler ultrasonic stethoscope. Here's assessment of the vascular system. So this is just what we started talking about. Dry, shiny, taut skin, loss of hair to the extremity, nails are thickened and rigid. There could be edema, gangrene after prolonged tissue necrosis. So what it will start out first, there'll be an ulcerated area that just will not heal because there's not enough blood flow to that area to to promote healing. Gangrene, the most common organism that causes gaseous gangrene, Clostridium perfrigens. So that is flesh eating bacteria. It can have little as 12 hours. The bacteria can eat through enough fleshy tissue that it could take the whole extremity. When they go to the OR and they have to debris all the way down to vascularized tissue, what the bacteria does is as it eats the flesh, it creates this gray goo. And when they go into the OR and they open up the cavity, they'll see a puff of gaseous material come out of the extremity. It's pretty intense. I've been into the OR to see it and it's something you will absolutely never forget. And here's a little more of a description of the ischemic muscle in intermittent claudication and it is a sign of peripheral arterial disease. It should resolve within 10 minutes or less and reproducible meaning if I get up and walk around the same exact distance I should be able to produce the same symptoms time and time again. And then assessment of the vascular system, rest pain. It is pain at the forefront at rest. It means that things are really not good. As far as supply and demand, it signifies severe arterial insufficiency. In order to get relief in a dependent position so that it improves perfusion, it typically only happens at night. And when you assess the pulses, they're diminished or absent. And we normally, this commonly happens in the pedal and the popliteal pulses. I have never seen it in the femoral. I'd be terrified if I saw it that high up. The Doppler to palpate. Anything you can't palpate, you always want to use the Doppler. Assessment of the vascular system. So we talked about the Latin root of paresthesia or thesia is feeling. So paresthesia is an abnormal feeling that just shouldn't be there. It could be shooting pain down the legs. It could be burning. It could be tingling, but it's a feeling that is not normally or should not be there. It can be present near ulcerated areas and it produces a loss of pressure and deep pain sensations. Injuries often go unnoticed by patients. So this is this poor neuropathy patient. The objective data, we're gonna continue on with our physical exam. We're gonna look at the arms and inspect and palpate. So we're, again, we're gonna be looking at overall skin color. Remember, we talked about when a hypoxemia, there's a deficiency somewhere in the body, that the body has a compensatory mechanism for that by, by alerting the sympathetic nervous system. And when epi's at play, there's vasoconstriction and the color of the skin gets gray, pale, they have pallor, and cyanotic. And a profile sign is an angle between the nail and the plate and the skin overlying the proximal part of the distal phalanx is about 160 degrees or less. When clubbing is present, proliferation of tissue under the nail plate causes this angle to increase to more than 160 degrees. I think it looks more like it makes the nail look a little more ski tip. As far as capillary refill, it would be for a lot of the patients that we're talking about with peripheral arterial disease, we wanna see brisk capillary refill, but we may not, more likely, three to five seconds for some of these people. Again, checking symmetry from side to side to make sure that the color on the left looks just as good on the right. Sometimes what can happen, like let's just give an example, a patient went to the cath lab and they were a right femoral approach. You'll always wanna check bilateral pulses. A lot of times the nurses only check the leg that's affected of where they actually injected. 
but you have to check the other side because patients can also throw a clot to the other side of that. So that's why checking symmetry, cap refill on both legs, regardless of, of whether they have a puncture site on that leg is so important. Checking a radial pulse is really critical now. And also the strength of the radial pulse. So we hope everyone's gonna be a plus two, but you know that there's people with terrible vasculatures out there. Palpate the ulnar pulse to make sure that if the radial has a clot in it, the ulnar pulse, the collateral circulation, that picks up the blood flow for the radial artery whenever something's going on there. And then the brachial pulse, you'll be checking that as you run up the arm. And then the epitrochlear lymph node, you'll be palpating if it's present, if you can feel it palpable or not. And then the modified Allen's test is just what I was telling you about the ulnar and the radial pulse. And I put a, a link to a video so you could see how the Allen test is done to assess collaterals if a radial pulse is occluded. Continuing on with the objective data, we're gonna look at the legs and we've already talked about this a lot. The skin and hair, again, symmetry from side to side. Temperature is important, checking from side to side. Again, if they throw clots to the other side, you wanna check the calf muscle. Did you know that if a blood clot is present in the leg, 50% of people who have a blood clot do not have a positive Hohmann sign. I know we don't check them anymore. It's not safe to do that. 50% of them experience pain, edema, and erythema at the site of the clot. The other 50% are completely unaware that they have a clot at all. Sometimes the only way you know if a clot is present is they'll have swelling. It'll look bigger, but the patient doesn't really have pain. The right calf will be bigger than the left, so that's all you have. And then looking at inguinal lymph nodes, you want to assess for the presence and what they feel like, and then the femoral pulse as you run the leg. So you want to assess leg veins when the patient is standing, and then perform the manual compression test, and that's on the course. Coast veins are this terrible problem. They're doing some really cool procedures, laser therapy. Basically, it's a dilated, torturous nature of the vein. It has a dull, achy pain that can come along with it. It can interfere with their sleep. They could have dizziness. Those areas where the vein is varicose is susceptible to trauma and infection. And then treatment is aimed at reducing venous stasis because what we don't want is to end up with more blood clots. Pitting edema, that's like plus four pitting edema. And then a venous thromboembolism. I feel like we beat this to absolute death in nursing school. Maybe not for you. So it's a formation in the blood vessel of a clot, a thrombus, that breaks loose and is carried by the bloodstream to another vessel where it plugs. Let me just mention about medication with this also. So let's say the patient's on Eliquis. Eliquis is only maybe 80%, 70-80% effective at preventing future blood clots. So then how does a patient make up for the other 30%? So that's based on modifiable factors. So that is placing the patient sequential devices on them. That means getting up and walking around and not being a slug. It's all those factors that comprise to give that patient the highest chance of not ending up with a pulmonary embolism. or And then preventing complications. So this is a perfect place to just talk about it. So any place that has edema, the skin can be broken down. It can be ulcerated. Changing positions frequently is really important. Fluid balance, when patients are fluid overloaded, sometimes they end up weeping like the Michelin man. Skin, the uh, fluid just comes out of them all over the place. It actually looked draw colored. Making sure you're assessing their vital signs, monitoring their oxygen levels. Anytime there is lack of blood flow, and lack of oxygen, that's when problems begin. Potential for anorexia and vagal stimulation. Perfusion, interventions that improve tissue circulation, and that could be from least invasive all the way to invasive. We could talk for hours about that. Prevention of peripheral vascular problems, education and talking to patients about all the things they can do to decrease their risks, and then actual non-invasive to invasive measures to enhance their circulation. Again, I like to show gross pictures, so I can't control myself, so here we go. We're gonna talk about peripheral vascular disease and show you some gross pictures. So care of ischemic foot lesions. We had patients getting ready awaiting transplant and on those vasoconstrictors, all their toes look like this. We would turn and reposition patients and their their black toes would fall off while we were turning and repositioning them. There were so many of them. We had a terrible joke called Dead Toe Tuesday because that's when the vascular clinic was open. The vascular docs would come in and be checking our patients. So anyway, that looks really bad. The anatomy of an artery, and you can certainly spend more time looking at that. So damaged arteries, it starts with obstructions from atherosclerotic plaques. So that's that whole cardiovascular disease where a thrombus or an embolus is formed. And also mechanical trauma, chemical and mechanical trauma sets our patients up for all of these cascades to, con 
to begin. And then another gaseous gangrene, so that patient's going to lose fifth toe and a good chunk of their foot. It's a sudden arterial occlusion, profound, and it's irreversible death. Sometimes if we catch things quick enough, we can get them to intervention that they can remove the clot and then restore perfusion, but most of the time they cannot. And then we have other situations where there's gradual occlusion and the collateral circulation around it can help provide blood flow to that area. So not all is lost, but if they don't have collaterals, then it's game over. And then arterial vessels, vessels that are more affected by disease. So the aortoiliac artery, the femoral artery, popliteal, tibial, and the perineal artery. And of course, those are gigantic arteries. And then patients end up going for fempop bypasses and all that great stuff. And then chronic artery occlusion. The hallmark symptom is intermittent claudication, rest pain when a severe occlusion occurs, elevating leg increases pain so they only feel better in a dependent position. Those are all diagnostic signs that we can see in patients to help us understand. And then more pictures, assessment of the vascular system. One we didn't talk about, but you see the great picture, which is comparison between pallor and rhubar. It's a reddish blue color in de dependent position. That's what their foot looks like when it's down. That is, that come rhubar is present when there's severe peripheral arterial damage and it occurs from vessels that cannot constrict and it just stays dilated and the blood gets stuck there. Just a little comparison between arterial disease and venous disease. Now we're back onto the veins. So we already talked about the function of veins, so I'm going to keep moving. The vessels become damaged by a thrombus. There are incompetent vessels valves, decreased pumping action of surrounding muscles, and the result is increased venous pressure. So if the pressure in the peripheral veins is greater than the pressure in the tissues, where does the fluid go? Think about hydrostatic pressure. Oh, I love that. So where does it go? It goes to the third space. So we have third spacing. When things move out, when hydrostatic and oncotic pressure become out of balance, it moves to the third space, so it becomes interstitial. The rest of venous disease so we're going to see edematous tissue. So you see different types of ulcers in both situations. There's edematous tissue. This in the middle, if I can do my thing, that's eschar, that's creamy eschar, that is dead tissue that is all going to have to be debrided and removed. So that person probably has really high fevers and could be septic from that wound. And then complications, they have delayed healing, wound infection, tissue necrosis, which buys them the time in the OR, are ulcers have a really tough time healing because of low blood flow situations, and then atrophy of the skin and underlying muscles. These poor patients can't get up and move around because it causes them pain and then no circulation. And then this is what ends up, ultimately, we, our patients get amputation and they get gaseous gangrene. That's all I have. Have a great day.